You're watching this video, so the chances are great that you enjoy what we create here at The Audrain. And if you do, why not take the next step and subscribe to this channel? You might also consider a membership in The Audrain Automobile Museum. We mount four new exhibitions each year featuring cars from The Audrain collections and loans from some of the leading collectors and institutions around the world. Click here to find out more. Summer day and a Ford Model 3. You know, they call the F1 the greatest car of the 20th century, but I think this is really it. it it's hard to, for people to even imagine the impact this vehicle had at the time it came out. Uh, I, I guess the closest thing would be the iPhone. Yeah. The something. iPhone has changed everybody's life. Something that and everybody it, possesses. It's changed right. fundamentally right. the way we live. Right. And Model D did exactly the same thing. And it's such a brilliant piece of engineering. It, it, to this day, it is still the only antique car I have that always starts either on the button with the electric starter or with a couple of pulls of the hand crank. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing how this thing works. The idea that, um, and we've talked about this before, but the idea that the basic rule of marketing and manufacturing that we see today in consumer electronics was true for cars. Right. As you said, every year that Ford made this, they were able to make it more efficiently and they lowered the price. Right, right. And uh, you can't sort of imagine that today in, in the automotive market. Well, C. Howard Wills was Henry Ford's first partner. And it's funny, he and Ford split everything 50%. You know, people think Henry Ford was a cheapskate. He wasn't. But he didn't like to give credit. So he'd always say, like the, with the vanadium steel, which I think Wills helped develop, he said he found a piece of steel in, in France on the in, on the floor somewhere, and oh, came back and you know, see that was a brilliant thing. He used the best materials available to make the cheapest automobile. You know, I, there's a Model T guy I deal with back east, and I thought he had a huge warehouse full of stuff. You know, I said when I come back, I'll come visit you. So, so I go to visit him, and he just has a house with a garage, and I go. Where's, where's your stuff? Where's your stuff? Well, come on up. So we go out back, and, and there was a little snow on the ground. He took a tarp off, and there was all these metal pieces on the ground, but they were vanadium steel. He would pick them up, he would sand them lightly, blow them off, and they were fine <laughs> because it was such a high-quality product. One of the top 50 greatest car events in the world returns. The Audrain Newport Concours and Motor Weeks. Join our chair, Jay Leno. Unforgettable cars in legendary settings. Cars on the road. Cars on display, spectacular locations, exclusive bespoke events, free events open to the public, something for every member of the family. Tickets on sale now. You know, for a place like Newport, this is still a very practical car to run to the market or run errands with, because we're cruising along 35, 40 miles an hour, and it's quite comfortable. And exactly. It, it drives nice, it's dependable, I mean, these always start because you have this magneto system. You don't even need a battery. It pulls this hill quite well. Now, of course, there's not a lot of hills on the Cruising Island, but, you know, it pulls the hill confidently. It's a terrific thing. Not even a fuel pump. It's all gravity. And Henry Ford had a great sense of humor about us, because he loved to go to vaudeville shows where people did Model T jokes. <laughs> and he, you know, people thought, oh, he's going to get mad. No, he loved it. Model T jokes. I mean, uh, his sense of humor was not the most sophisticated. One of his favorite was there was a famous comedy duo time. They had a routine. What's
What time is it when two Fords crash into each other? 10 to 10. Oh! <laughs> okay, not, not really. I think she used that in your act. Yeah, I don't think you see Chappelle or Chris Rock doing it, but, <laughs> but uh, I mean, that was the kind of joke. I mean, he loved those kind of jokes about the working man, about the, uh, anytime a Model T would, you know, chuck past a Rolls Royce that was stuck in the mud. Or, you know, and because, it, and competitors would say his cars were flimsy. And he used to say, who are you going to bet on a race, the skinny man or the fat man? And that was, a, that was another one. He, he had comebacks for everything. everything. Yeah. He was a real piece of Americana. Un, unfortunately, uh, there was a, yeah, there, there well, was a we, dark we won't side. Go there. I know, and, that, and, that, and, it, and it's too bad. It's yeah. too bad. So today we're going to go see a really remarkable house. Now, the connection between the cars we're driving today, this Model T Ford, we'll be driving a 1972 Pinto and then a 2009 Shelby GT 500 KR. Okay. The connection will be made by the time we finish the day. I, I, yeah, I'm sure it will be somehow. They're, they're all Fords, I don't know. What is... Well, we'll see. All right. But the house we're going to go see, High Tide, is really a remarkable piece of Rhode Island architecture that is unmatched on this island. So uh -huh. let's go take a look at a Norman castle. Let's do it. <laughs> Today, here we are at High Tide. It's beautiful. It is an amazing property. The house was built in 1900. The architects were Warren and Wetmore and built for Edith and William Starr Miller. Uh, William Miller was a real estate developer in New York City and his wife Edith was the sister of the architect. Oh, okay. This is a magical spot here in Newport because it's the highest point above Ocean Avenue. So we've got this wonderful view of the ocean. We're high above. This is great breeze, a typical Newport sailing breeze here. You really feel it. It's quite you know, wonderful. I can hear it too because they have wind chimes on the other side of the house. Yes. And they're trying to keep them quiet, but it is so windy. <laughs> and people probably hear it on the mic too because, but on a day like today where it's hot, boy, it's a nice breeze coming off the ocean. You want this. Yeah. This house is built in Norman style, typified by the arched windows. Right. And it's built in a very sort of French manor style, but typical of Normandy and places like that. But when you go into this house, which is a stuccoed Norman style house, right. you expect it sort of to be dark and, 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 and closed in. This house has a surprise for us. Really? All Let's right. take a look. I'm not a big stucco fan, but it doesn't look like stucco. It sort of looks like limestone. It does look like limestone. Wow, this is beautiful. It's an amazing house and it takes the forms of the Norman country house, the turreted areas and things like that, the L shape to take advantage of the site and really takes real full advantage of that inside the house. This wonderful octagonal foyer is just absolutely great. And of course, uh, Whitney Warren, the architect, collaborated with Ogden Codman on the interiors. And of course, Codman did the interiors at the Breakers, at Hope Dean, at uh, a number of very, very well-known uh, buildings here in Newport and he has this very light and classical uh, effect which again contrasts with the stucco Norman exterior but complements it so incredibly well. I like small rooms. I hate flow. <laughs> you know, I go to these houses in LA and you walk in and there's a massive room and another massive room and they flow. I like you have little doors you can shut yourself off. Each room appears to almost have its own fireplace which I guess in 1900, you probably, you could heat up that room if you wanted to with a nice fireplace. Oh yeah. And this is another thing which is uh, very much to your point, is that putting separate rooms like this also allows for the drama of the view. So right. let's step this way and we okay. get to see a grand room which is very intimate in scale in so many ways. Well, you know me with libraries. And this is a great example of what I was talking about outside. The fact that this is a house that you think might be sort of closed in, very monastic. 
you see these big windows, these right. great French doors, and this incredible view of the ocean and, and the brightness here. Well, it's nice because it's a nice view, but I don't feel exposed. You know, some of these houses you walk into, especially in LA, it's floor to ceiling glass. You realize if you're not dressed properly to enter each room, <laughs> You look like an exhibitionist. You know exactly, I mean? you're in a fishbowl. And I love the fact that I love small panes. I like each one is framed like that instead of having a massive glass. You just have each individual pane. I, I think it's fantastic. You have a great sense of interior, but also the exterior. Yeah. The next room we'll see also really shows off the expertise of Ogden Codman design. Let's take a look at that. Okay, this would be my wife's favorite room. I gotta admit, I, I like the other one, but you know, this one, it's so surprising and so airy and cheery. You, you wouldn't think I would like a yellow room, but I really do, it's really beautiful. This is one of my favorite rooms in this yeah. house. It also shows to great effect the work of Ogden Codman. The trim with the acanthus leaves all around the uh, window frames and the molding at the top and you know, this is something again that you respond to very much, the yeah. level of detail, but not sort of overwhelming detail. No, it's not that no. you're looking, oh my God, there's so much going on in the room, but just sort of where you rest your eye, there's something happening. I can't think of any modern house in LA where I want to look up, because there's nothing to see. It's just a square city. You know, look at the trim and the, oh, just beautiful. I, I wonder if there was ever a chandelier there at one time. Do you think there was? It was one? quite likely there was yeah. in 1900 especially. And I also love this little effect, which is repeated in a number of the rooms. This is a round room. In the parquet on the floors, there's a little band of round. Oh, I see that. Very nice. That, yeah. That also gives a nautical look as well, which is yeah. quite interesting. You know, yeah. Very typical here of Newport. And uh, the next room is the dining room, leading to probably my second favorite room in the house, the breakfast Let's room. Let's take a look. Even details down to the hinges on the doors are a work of art in this house. And again, Ogden Codman plays so beautifully with shapes. This room is oval. We've been in, a, in, a, in an octagonal room, in a round room, now we're in an oval dining room. Yeah, just, um, just amazing. And again, one of these things where you see you are here on the ocean, but you're in a very cozy room. At night, this room will be as entertaining as it is during the day. Right, right. Which is often not the case in an oceanfront house where it has got lots of windows and all of a sudden half of the room just goes black and there's nothing there. Right, right. And of course, the breakfast room. Which wow, is that's really astonishing. something. You know, each room I enter becomes my favorite room. <laughs> and again, look at the ceiling. Just, it's, just it's amazing. It's like being you know, in a wonderful observatory here overlooking Almy Pond right. and the ocean. And not just coincidentally, I happen to live on the other end of Almy Pond right down there. So oh, I have views from my house of this house with the wonderful chimneys on top and the roof, it's absolutely yeah, beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah. That house looks similar, but it's not, it's not this house, is it? No. No, that's the clubhouse of the Newport Country Club, which is also done by Whitney Warren, the same architect. Okay. The only two projects uh, that they actually realized here in Newport. Well, this is magnificent. It looks like a circus tent. It's really magnificent. It's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, the next room we're going to see might actually have a view of another local Newport notable house. Let's mm. take a look. We'll see. <laughs> And Jay, I know that this will be another one of your favorite rooms because not only do you have this wonderful warm paneling, a nice fireplace, and an outstanding view, which features this little known cottage uh, here called Sea Fair. Oh yeah, you can see my house. Look at that. So despite the ruined view, it still is a really nice room. It is a nice room, yeah. <laughs> but again, this really takes advantage of the shapes in this uh, house and really demonstrates how you can adapt a style that is meant for very intimate cold weather living, the Norman typical house, into a house so incredibly well suited for this site in Newport. Beautiful. Amazing. Now, let's sample our next car. Today, our next car, another populist car. I remember these. Ah, oh, it's got a proper gearbox. Indeed it does. Well, Jay, from the first 
essential transportation to essential transportation approximately 50 years later. Yeah, and you know, it wasn't bad. Um, this car has a 1.6 liter engine, about 86 horsepower, manual transmission, but it weighs under 2,000 pounds, which is... Inconceivable today. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's conceivable today. Yeah, obviously not a lot of safety features other than the seatbelt. But you know, if you're used to driving an import like a Volkswagen, that was 36 to maybe 45 horsepower. This is double the horse. It actually, you know, I, I like it. I mean, ah, it's a stick. So glad it is. This is a very, very unique example of the Pinto. This is an 18,000 mile from new Pinto, completely original. I had a 1973 Pinto Squire wagon with a four-speed manual gearbox, and I love the car. Yeah. Well, did you guys have the same engine or the bigger one? Same engine. Yeah. Same 1.6 liter engine. And um, one of the interesting things about this, too, is the fact that you look at the relative sizes of cars. The Model T is more or less the same size as this Pinto. Right. And uh, this was the second attempt by the Detroit manufacturers to seriously uh, attack the import invasion. Right, right. Uh, you know, the first one back in 1960 saw the Corvair and the Valiant. Uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't quite... They were just shrunken big cars. Right, exactly. Although, I mean, the Corvair, of course, had the unique uh, engineering feature, the rear engine, all right, that stuff. Right. But it was basically a shrunken big car. And 10 years later, they all decided, you know what? These people are actually making inroads, not just the Europeans, but the Japanese had right, started. Right. And so you had the Ford Pinto, the Chevrolet Vega, and the AMC Gremlin. Right. And these cars were actually much better conceived as import fighters, because these actually, to us at least, felt like foreign cars. Right, you know? right. They had the same kind of spirit, the lightness, the compact uh, packaging, all of that. And, uh, you know, again, uh, I don't know if it was a matter of boredom or uh, just the American public saying, well, this is what I want from this nameplate, from a Ford, from a Chevrolet. And these were AMC. hugely successful. Yes. They sold mil I they think sold three million of these during the, during the run. Yeah, this was, of course, the famous product liability suit where... Yeah, exactly. The Pinto, as I... I'm not an expert on this case, but that apparently there was an exhaust hanger and a bolt went this way. So when the car was hit, the bolt punctured the gas tank, which caused the fire. Uh, I remember, I do, you know, I remember the case. I remember reading the story because it so shocked the American public. It was the biggest legal uh, verdict against a major manufacturer, I think, in the history of American jurisprudence. There, this is a car built in 1972. And the build quality is very, very good. So those people yeah. that say, well, they never built a good car in America in the 1970s, it's not true at all. I don't miss the power. It seems to have enough power to me. Yeah. Maybe with four people in it, it might be a little bit. Well, the thing is this. Yes, you're not missing the power in terms of, of being in traffic and using the car in a modern way. But frankly, the chassis, the steering, the gearbox feels that it could handle much more right there's a uh, and there was actually even some very shortly considered development work about a v8 pinto which would have been an, I think, an absolute disaster um but you know between the pinto and its mercury cousin the bobcat you know it offered a lot of uh of value and space and performance for the yeah. uh, person who wanted to buy america but you get the feeling all the parts came from something else Oh, absolutely. It's all, was, it's all parts bin stuff. Well, that was one of the uh, successes of the Pinto. Frankly, yeah. it, was a, it was a recipe for it to follow before, as you know, because the Mustang was a Falcon. Right, right. And uh, GM was going to strike out with that sandcast aluminum engine uh, developed partly by Opel, and they were going to really give the consumer something that was really European, the Vega 2300. Right, right. And uh, that didn't work out so well. But... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But this is a very interesting uh, part. And now, the next car that we're going to drive today is going to take the idea of history to a totally new level. Well, this sounds like one of your tenuous connections. I'd be curious to see. We're getting more and more tenuous by the moment. And Just what is wait. the next car? You'll tell me when we get there? Absolutely. All right.
And now for something completely different and completely Ford. Check it out. Well, Jay, our final car of the day, as promised, a real performance car. Yeah, I got stuck with two O'Connell boxes. You get the performance car. Tell them what we're driving. This is a 2009 Shelby GT500 KR. And uh, of course, KR is quite famous as king of the road. Right, right. And it's a reference to the original 1968 uh, Shelby GT500 KR. Now, was this the first reincarnation, or incarnation, I guess? Well, I guess it would be reincarnation of the uh, Shelby connection. I mean, Shelby kind exactly. of kind of was with Ford. I don't know what happened. Went to Chrysler with Bob Lutz and the Viper, and there was a connection there, although there was no Shelby Viper. Then he did the GLH, remember the Goes Go Like, like hell, hell, yeah. Which <laughs> is kind of a fun little Econo box. And, other. Yeah, okay. little, and uh, then he came back to Ford again. Was this the first car he did when he came back? This is the first one, and unlike all of the other Shelby branded cars, this car is actually finished. It was started in a, in a Ford factory by a special group. But then the cars were actually shipped to Shelby International right. Automobiles uh, to be finished. So these are actual Shelby cars um, listed in the Shelby registry as such. Uh, and they built a limited number of these. They built 1,571 right. to match the number that they built in the 1968s. Okay. And it's a prodigious performance car. Again, you think about the passage of time. This has become a sort of a theme with us. Um, but 2009 is not that long ago, but it's not exactly yesterday but 540 horsepower, uh, pretty stout. It is, that would be the, uh, almost like we'd react to 750 today. Exactly. Uh, because 540, I mean, uh, for years, the most you could get in any car was 350 with the Corvette. And then the Viper came along with that 400. And that sort of started the muscle car war again. Mm -hmm. Then the next generation Viper had 450. And then the Z06 Corvette came along, 435. And then that went up a little higher. And, you know, and then it's been going crazy ever since. It has. It has not stopped uh, since this car uh, came out. And also one of the things that's uh, very interesting, too, is that this car is supercharged. And uh, I happen to be a big fan of supercharging. You know, I've got the uh, Mercedes 230 SLK. Right. Um, I had one of the first uh, BMW Mini Coopers, uh, which were also supercharged. And uh, there, there's something about the way a supercharger delivers power as opposed to a turbo. I like turbo cars too, but right. there's, there's this sort of, it's more mechanical, you know, this yeah. sort of this. And this. It's, it's an interesting trade-off because with a turbocharged car, it's essentially free horsepower. Right. It doesn't use horsepower to run the turbocharger. It just uses waste, uh, few waste pressure. Waste, waste pressure, yeah. Yeah, you know. So you got to say, well, that, uh, ecology wise or uh, whatever reason, that makes more sense, you know. It's more efficient. More efficient, yeah. yeah. I know the Duesenberg supercharger it took like 25 <laughs> horsepower to run. Uh, my Merlin engine, that's 150 horsepower to run the supercharger, supercharger. to power the engine. And so, of course, you know, you think about those superchargers, which are really sort of uh, almost the equivalent of, of press to pass. Right. The thing that, that gave you a lot of power, but you didn't use it all the time. <laughs> oh, sure. I remember yeah. the Mercedes. I was in that uh, Count Trotsky car, ah, yes. which oh had the God. screaming. You could use the supercharger for like eight seconds, no more than 10. It just, just the most blood curdling screech. It, um, oh my God, nothing seemed to happen, but apparently, <laughs> I think you were going a little faster, but just to kick that super, just to engage it, yeah. to hear that scream was really something. Think about what these Fords represent, oh, which is right. a solid, sensible, basic concept. Right. High Tide is a simple, almost plain, Norman-style architecture of a French country manor, but elevated by its location above the ocean, the incredible light, the detailed interiors of Ogden Codman in the house, it takes it to a different place. Well, I think we have redefined the word tenuous, <laughs> because I don't see, I mean, to me, I find it 
not an ordinary house at all. I mean, it just seemed that beautiful sunroom. Most houses don't have that. The beautiful way you, 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 when you enter, you can go into this beautiful sitting area. You've got a library. You've got, I mean, I, I didn't, I don't, I, I, you, you think it's a, a basic, simple house, huh? Basic and simple, yes, but taken to the next level. Okay. That's the connection. So it's basic and simple taken to complicated and expensive. <laughs> so it, if you want to look at it that way, I prefer well, that. I have to admit, this is one of my favorite homes because it, it, it really does have the old world charm, yet you, you get enough light. Because sometimes I go to these houses and there's too much light. I don't like floor to ceiling glass. You know, I, I, I like I like little diamond pane windows like this, you know, that kind of stuff. It doesn't have that, but it's airy, yet it's cozy at the same time. Exactly. I, oh, I think it's just a great, great house. It's a wonderful house, and I'm glad we got to share it with our viewers. It's high tide. <laughs>